in a virtual uh, worship experience on tonight. Um, and tonight we just want to continue our conversation. How can the church step in as a community of believers to assist some things that in, in some things that are going on? It was a time that uh, that it is something that should not be ignored any ever before appeared sad in his presence. to have you as a part of uh, the Be Restored Worship Center virtual uh, worship experience on tonight. Um, and tonight we just want to continue our conversation in reference to moving on and just kind of dealing with what we have uh, all seen and experienced and are going through. And uh, we definitely want to make it as interactive as possible. Um, but what I, wanted, what I wanted to do, and as I was kind of thinking about this whole topic of moving on and kind of where we are. Um, Nehemiah came to uh, mind and um, I'm going to read, start at Nehemiah chapter two, reading from the New Living Translation. Um, starting at verse one, chapter two, verse one says, early the following spring in the month of Nisan, during the 20th year of King Azarsis reign, I was serving the king his wine. I had never before appeared sad in his presence. So the king asked me, why are you looking so sad? You don't look sick to me. You must be deeply troubled. Then I was terrified, but I replied, long live the king. How can, how can I not be sad for the city where my ancestors are buried is in ruins and the gates have been destroyed by fire? The king asks, well, how can I help you? With a prayer to God, the God of heaven, I replied, if it please the king, and if you are pleased with me, your servant, send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. The king with the queen sitting beside him asked, how long will you be gone? When will you return? And after I told him how long I would be gone, the king agreed, to my request. I also said to the king, if it please the king, let me have letters addressed to the governors of the province west of the Euphrates River, instructing them to let me travel safely through their territories on my way to Judah. And please give me a letter addressed to ASAP, the manager of the king's forest, instructing him to give me timber. I will need it to make beans for the gate of the temple fortress for the city walls and for a house for myself. And the king granted these requests because of the gracious hand of God was upon me. So I'm going to stop right there. So when we uh, look at this particular passage, we understand that uh, Jerusalem has been overtaken and the city is in ruins. In, in chapter one, uh, Nehemiah has a visitor. And when the visitor comes, he's excited to see someone from his hometown because he's in exile, he's been serving, and he's excited because he knows that some of his family and some of his friends have returned back to Jerusalem. And he does not receive good news. He says, listen, there has been, uh, the city's been overtaken, the walls have been destroyed, uh, there's just calamity everywhere in the city. And Nehemiah is distraught. The Bible even says, Nehemiah says that he had, had, had a, a, a time of emotionalism. It, it said that he cried, he mourned, he was sad. And after that, Nehemiah prays. He fasts and then he prays. So after he goes through his period of kind of dealing with the heaviness of what's going on, he prays. And here's the thing about it. Sometimes we feel like when we're dealing with situations that it's beneath us to feel emotions. But things that we 
care about things that affect us affect us emotionally and but the key is to not allow our emotions to overtake us and to be the main thing so it's okay to cry it's okay to mourn it's okay to uh be upset all of that all of those emotions are valid however there comes a time when you we have to move beyond those feelings of emotion and then we have to seek god seek the face of god seek direction from god so in this particular passage we see that nehemiah does this and here's the key that when nehemiah spends this time in prayer to god as it relates to his home he does that for four months the bible says he's in prayer for four months so a lot of times we feel like we pray today and then tomorrow we're going to move or tomorrow is the time that we're going to do a thing but we also have to understand the timing and the importance of when god wants us to move and and and, and also make sure that we hear clear direction and that the timing is going to be right for us to do what it is that he has us to do so we can hear the strategy of god so when you get some time definitely go to nehemiah one because it specifically breaks down the prayer of nehemiah and what he prays for and i'm actually going to go there so um nehemiah chapter one verse four says this when i heard of this it says after he's he hears about what's going on in jerusalem he says when i heard this i sat down and wept in fact for days i mourned fasted and prayed to the god of heaven then said i O lord god of heaven the great and awesome god who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those whom he loves and obey his commandments listen to my prayer look down and see me praying night and day for your people israel i confess that i have sinned against you yes even my own family and i have sinned we have terribly sinned by not obeying your commands decrees and regulations that you gave us through your servant moses please remember what you told your servant moses if you are unfaithful to me i will scatter you among the nations but if you return to me and obey my commands and live by them then even if you are exiled to the ends of the earth i will bring you back to the place i have chosen for my name to be honored verse 10 he says this the people you rescued by your great power and strong hand are your servants oh lord please hear my prayer listen to the prayers of those of us who delight and honor you please grant me success today by making the king favorable to me put it in his heart to be kind to me see he lays his prayer out he addresses everything lord i understand that i've sinned that i've fallen short i understand that we as a people have let you down and there but there's some things that you promised so now i'm bringing you in remembrance of the things that you promised to us through moses so the things that god has promised us through his word we have to remind him so yes we we, we had a time of emotionalism we had a time of mourning but in the prayer nehemiah is very specific about where he is and what he needs the lord to do and here's the thing he prays for favor right with the king so that's where we picked up what i was just reading in nehemiah chapter 2 that when he gets into the presence of the king because he is the cupbearer the cupbearer is very important he's very close to the king because that's the person who makes sure that whatever is being served to the king is not poison so he's he's a very trusted person so he's going back and forth to the king during this period mind you it says that he spent spent four months in prayer to god so he had been going back and forth to the king and on this particular day his countenance is sad 
And see, you also have to understand that in that day, when you got before the king, it was almost treason to be sad or to, to, to look like the weight of the world was on you. You had to be joyful because the idea was that if you were in the presence of the king, you were automatically uh, joyful that the presence of the king was something that was so awesome that whatever you were dealing with would, you know, be wiped away. Like, so it was kind of an insult if you got into the king's presence and had a countenance of sadness and, and, and looked like you were distraught. So that's why when he goes before the king and the king is like, you look sad today because he's never seen Nehemiah looking sad. So he's like, you look sad today you don't look sick, so what's going on? And so that's why he exclaims, long live the king, because he makes sure it's not you, king. I don't have a problem with you. However, when I look at my city and the place that my ancestors came from, I see destruction. The, the walls have been torn down. There's, there, there, there's fire that's destroyed some things. And even if we look at where we are right now, we look around not only this nation, but this world, and we see there are some things that have been torn down. There has been some things that have been burned down, um, and it makes us feel a certain way. If we be honest about it, it makes us feel a certain way. And there's a certain mourning that a lot of us feel. There's a certain helplessness that some of us feel by what we see going on. And, and it's all across the country. So it does not matter where you are, you look out and there's a sadness that you have for your city. As valid as whatever it may be, or whatever, whatever your opinion is, there is a sadness because we understand that there is something going on, that the earth has been shaken, that the city has been shaken. And parts of it is, is now laying in ruins. And here's the thing. Sometimes things have to come down. There are certain things, there are certain walls, there are certain structures that have to come down. And by them coming down, it puts us in the position to rebuild them. So what happens is that when Nehemiah goes before the king, remember, he prayed for favor. So now when he gets before the king, he's able to make his request known specifically to the king. So here's what we have to do in moving on. So we have our time of sadness, mourning, emo whatever your emotion is. But after that, however long it takes, you have to seek God. And after that time, when he gives you the position and the time to speak to those in authority, you have to have something to say. You have to have a plan. Imagine if in that instance that Nehemiah had audience with the king, he had no plan, that he did not know what to ask. So God is positioning you to have a voice. So you've got to be able to use your voice and know what it is and know what the plan is and, and know what it is that you're, that you're seeking after. Because when that time presents itself, you can't be, try, you can't be uh, feeling around like, uh, well, I, I don't know. I mean, I think, no, he had a plan to say, listen, this is what's going on. If it pleases you, this is what I need from you. I need some resources. I need your decree. I need your backing. I need your support. And allow me to go back to where the destruction is, allow me to go to where the hurt is, allow me to go where the ruins are so that I can rebuild it. So it's one thing to sit back and feel a certain way about a thing. It's one thing to pray about a thing, but you have to have the power and the strength and the anointing in you to go to where the hurt is, go to where the destruction is. Sometimes we like to sit in a high place and look down. But in this hour, God is calling for us to do the work. Whatever your work is, whatever your thing is, you have to be in the position to do the work. We can't look for somebody else to do the work, but God is going to give you specifically a voice. 
in a position of authority, to someone in the position of authority. And that position of authority will, will manifest itself in different ways. It may be governmental. It may be in the business sector. It may be in the educational system. It may be in your neighborhood. But there are people that have decision-making power that God is going to put you in the position to speak to. And that's what we have to get to as the body of Christ and as his people, we have to understand that all of this had to happen the way that it happened. And in that, we cannot be silent. We cannot stay behind the walls and then look for someone else to speak power to authority. We can't to speak truth to power. We can't sit back and let other systems and other things take that place. But the church, the kingdom of God, the true church, we are the church, has to use our voice to speak up to whatever the situation is and then pre be prepared to do the work. And isn't it amazing that at this time around the country, the physical doors of the church in a lot of areas are closed. But the church is now more open than it's ever been. So we don't have an excuse of staying behind the walls because sometimes we get comfortable behind the four walls of the church. But God has now put even the church in a position that we are forced to come from behind our church walls and help rebuild the walls of the city. Wherever your city is, God has given us the ability and the power in this day and age to rebuild the city. So whatever your city is, whatever it is, whatever your, your voice of influence is, you have to be able to have a plan so that when you come before that person of authority, you can speak with knowledge and understanding. He, under, he knew what was going on. He knew what had happened. He knew that, that Jerusalem had faced war, that the city's uh, walls, their defenses were down, that the structures had been destroyed. He understood that the people had turned away from God. He understood everything that was going on and could speak to it. But not only did he know, but he saw within himself that I have to go do what I believe that God is calling me to do in this time. So in our moving on, we have to really seek God to say, okay, where is it that I need to go? What is it that I personally need to do, both individually and as a ministry? Where is God calling us to go to rebuild, to speak to society, to, to, to speak to governments, to speak to business, to speak to education? Where is it that God is taking you? And then when he takes you there, you've got to maximize your time. Because when that moment happens, those moments are God moments. And oftentimes you will not get that opportunity again, not in that way. So Nehemiah used that moment in the presence of the king to, to address everything that he wanted to address. And the king had favor upon him. Remember, he had prayed to God, God, give me favor. So God gave him favor with the king so that he had the, the letters that he needed to talk to the governors to where he was going. He had resources. Everything that he needed, he had. He had everything that he needed. And here's the thing. He even had a plan. He told the king how long it was going to take him and how long he was going to be gone. So because he worked for the king and he had a position of authority, he was able to speak, tell the king, like, listen, this is how much time I'm going to need. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I need from you. And I'm going to go there and I'm going to do this work. And even when Nehemiah got there, he faced opposition. So we understand that anytime we're doing a work, we're going to face opposition. So the neighboring uh, jurisdictions, the, the neighboring kingdoms of Jerusalem, you know, they scorned him. They, they wanted to, you know, hinder him from doing the work, but Nehemiah stayed committed to what he was doing. And we know based on 
the information that we have, it took him 52 days to rebuild the wall. So in 52 days, he was able to rebuild the wall. And the wall symbolized strength. It symbolized protection. It symbolized um, hope. It, it, it restored uh, their confidence and their faith because now you have built this fortress, this wall that protects us. So here's what we have to understand where we are now. If we look at things in our society and the things that are going on and the injustices that are going on, uh, right now we see walls coming down. We see structures coming down. We see symbols coming down. And here's what happens. After all that comes down, we're going to have to rebuild in the right way that the things that once were there cannot be built again in that same way, right? So it's going to take us really putting our hands to the plow and rebuilding the way that God wants us to rebuild. And so here's the other thing. When, when we talk about the societal issues, Nehemiah was not scared. He did not back away from addressing the issues of Jerusalem and the things that they had done and how they had turned away from God that put them in the position that they were in. He was not afraid to speak that. So yes, he came to build the physical walls, but he also came to build them back up spiritually and to get them back on the right track. To say, hey, this, this is where we are now. Here's the problem. And sometimes we focus so much on the problem, but we've also got to offer solutions to the problem. So, hey, it's time to turn back to God. Hey, we've, you've done this. Uh, you've done that. Hey, I'm guilty of this. Okay, that's water under the bridge. But here we are today. And how do we move forward and dre address how we move forward? We know the problem. We know the issue. But how do we move forward? And, and Nehemiah was able to speak to those societal issues, those spiritual issues that had brought the society to where they are. So once we understand on a high level that there are certain uh, things that we um, have given away to spiritually or not built ourselves up spiritually or allow certain things to come up spiritually that have affected us and it has allowed the enemies that surround us to come in. And then we see destruction happen. We see the, the walls have been destroyed and things have been burned because the enemy has come in and destroyed those things. But all is not lost. Again, that's the problem. That's where it is. But we can't stay there. We have to have solutions. So I'm going to pause right there. Cause I don't, I want to, if anybody wants to chime in and has something to say, I don't want to just talk, but I just want to stop right there. So we've dealt with the emotional part of moving on. We've dealt with the societal part of moving on and how we have to speak to power and use our voice. So does any possible Linda, Elder Cynthia, anyone want to chime in where we are right now? Now nah, we'll keep moving. I just want to, you know, questions or anything where we at. Hey, you know, I um I I I'm loving this tonight. This is this is great stuff. Um dealing with, you know, how do we get past the pain? Um we've we've identified our pressure points, you know, and um we all know what those are. Even people who have been in denial about things being a point of pain for us are now coming uh, at a place of reckoning that uh, that it is something that should not be ignored any longer. And so now that we have that out of the way, I, I hear you, I hear you tonight. Now that we have that out of the way, how are we going to move forward? How do we really rebuild? I think that one thing that we need to um, take a pause and look and identify our community. I think we need to identify our community. Who is our community? Um, who are who are those persons, and who is the what is the group that will help us um, to be able to move forward? Because you can hang with the wrong crowd and end up still being stuck in a rut. Because some people like to pacify the pain a lot longer than those who are trying to actually 
progress and move forward and get, they're, they're tired of being depressed. They're tired of being uh, broken and, and, um, and without any hope or help. And so, so you gotta be able to identify who your community is and who's going to help you, who's gonna be, who can you, who can you actually rub shoulders with you know, in this, in this season, it, it, because in some cases it may, it may not be who you were doing it with before, um, uh, because they may not want, they may not want to move forward. They may not want to, um, help rebuild. They may not want to, um, and, and I, and I heard you talking about, you know, Nehemiah, um, but I, but I, my, my mind actually went also to Esther, you know, you know, cause when she went in for the king, she's like, I'm, I'm going in with purpose. I'm going in to save. I'm gonna take. I'm putting myself on the limb. I'm putting myself out here. Uh, she was like, Listen, if I perish, let me perish. But I'm going in to see this king, and I'm going in, and I'm going in not just for myself, but I'm going in for a whole people. And so she recognized what her what her position was. And I heard you say that. Um, that we must be in position and and we got to have a plan when we get in position you know so um, so so all of I, I think that all of the time that we are spending you know um, being away from our regular community uh, the way we are accustomed to I think that we have to maximize this time that we have and and start and and get past the woe is me part we're we're mourning all right we we you, you guys didn't tell me that i was supposed to wear black tonight because this was a morning period we were mourning tonight but you know but we've we've got to we've got to move we got to we got to get to moving now and um and i'm telling you pastor micah i want i want to be around a people uh, you know, that my community is a community of people who are ready to move forward. People who are saying, you know what, we might get, we might get a couple of more um, blows. We may go through a couple of more battles. We may have to fight just a little bit more, but we have a plan. Right, right. We, have, we have a plan to get out of this. And so the, you know, so the, um, the and, and the plan is to, uh, to bring us up out of the emotional, um, the the emotional and the depressive state that we've been in, um, this has been one. Of, this has been a very traumatic experience uh, for all of us, and so individually, but we still have an assignment for the kingdom of God. We still have that assignment. And so what are we going to do? We're just going to keep laying down in it and, and, and wallowing in it and saying, oh, woe is, woe is me and woe, are, woe is my people. You know, are we just going to continue along that vein or are we willing now to say, you know what, let me roll up my sleeves. You know what? Let me dust. Let me dust. Let me dust off my my um, my battle tools. Let me. Let me let me just let me pull myself up out of this one, because because uh, and having those people again, I'll go back to the community of having those people around you that say, oh no, we're not going there today. <laughs> no, we're not going to stay there today. I I feel you, but but can we move forward? So that's that's what I would say for for right now. Yeah. And, and one of the things that um, really hit me when you were talking about Esther. So when we look at Esther as mm -hmm. well as Nehemiah, they used their voice on behalf of their community, their people. They were not, it was not about them at that moment. Like it wasn't about seeking. A lot of times, even in, in church settings, a lot of times when we talk about having favor or God bringing us in front of people of influence, a lot of time it's self-based. It's Yes. You're going to speak to somebody or come in contact with somebody that's going to propel you forward or help you to do, which is fine. But however, where we are right now, you've got to use wrong your time, wrong season for that. For everybody out. That, that's not this season. We're not in that season. But here's exactly. the thing, though. Even when you look at this story, when Nehemiah is speaking to the king mm -hmm. about what he needs to rebuild, he also throws in there, I'm going to need some lumber to build my own house. Yes. 
So he still addresses this, this, this small piece. So it's not that he didn't get anything out of the situation because he understood, hey, I, I need somewhere to live. So in my resources, I need this to build my house, but that's not my purpose. So he was able to build something for himself, but he was about the work. It wasn't, he didn't go to him like, King, this is what's going on with me. I need some money because I need this new house. I need this or that. He didn't speak about any of that. He wasn't over there saying, can you hook a brother up? Right, right. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but he was like, I I am sad. And the reason, Mm -hmm. I, I can't be happy right now because this is what's going on with my people, with my community, where I've come from. So there was a countenance that he, because the king says, I've never seen you sad. I've never seen you look so heavy. So what's going, so he, that caught the attention, but he was able to transition that to say, Hey, this is why, but I got a, I got a plan. I don't plan on staying sad. I don't plan on staying distraught, but you have the authority and the power, the power to back me up and give me the resources and the support. So if it please you, Here's my plan. I need this to do this. I need this letter. I need lumber. I need, I, I, this is everything that I need to make this happen. And I'm going here. If you let me leave, give me a leave of absence from my job. I'm going here. And this is what I'm going to do. And because he understood also that the king didn't have to let him go. So that's why he chose his words very carefully. Sometimes it's not what you say, it's how you it's say how it. how you say it. Yes. And, and, and he understood that. So he, had, he spoke in reverence to his position to say, if it please you. You know, and sometimes we feel like, well, I'm, I'm not going to back down, you know, whatever. I'm just going to come with it. And I'm going to just say, I need to do this. Sometimes you got to like, we have to learn how to speak in, our, in certain settings. In certain settings, it may take just coming straight certain and then in a different setting we got to know our audience yeah and in this season you have we have to know our audience and who we're speaking to some people we can throw the fist up and come straight for it some people we have to sit down and have a dialogue and a conversation some you know we each one of us have been in those positions within our life and you can't always use the same position like esther had a different approach than Nehemiah, but they were able to use their time, their voice, their influence to do what they needed to do. And they were doing it and speaking on behalf of others and not themselves. So so this, and so this is where uh, I'm glad you all mentioned, I'm sorry, this is where I think it was good for the, you know, for you mentioning where the church, the body of the believers is at this point that we can't approach things as we have done in the past uh my four and no more you know we really got to go from the standpoint of we are representatives i was thinking on the way home today uh of we are how can the church step in as a community of believers to assist some things that in in some things that are going on it was a time when the church was the leadership you know in these in these type of uh matters that are going on but now we've become so self-centered about you know where we are and how we're going to build our own kingdom if you will so uh right now the the voice really should be the voice of the community what the community's needs really are about and what the community's needs are uh, on behalf of the people so this is a time where the church can really become the servant leaders that we are supposed to be in which case we are representative of the people. And it's not just the people that are on our roll. <laughs> you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's the people that, you know, have a need in order to become that servant leader. So, so yes, I see the Nehemiah and I see the Esther. So when the next persons come up as representative of the church, we need to take note. Uh, as it's been mentioned, of the fact that we're not there just for ourselves, but we're there uh, on behalf of others. I was in a conversation today. This is this is how you you you. This is really kind of striking home with me today. I was in a conversation today with my boss, and I no, I don't have certain you know background that that he may have, but I'm a visionary. And so in, in being a visionary, maybe I can see some things that maybe you couldn't have seen from your angle before because you're too much in the thick of it. Everybody's power, power, power. You know, but uh, uh, wait a minute, let's take a step back 
and see the whole picture, see the whole forest as much as we as much as we can of it in order to move forward. So everybody can move forward. It's not just a moving forward just for ourselves. It's a moving forward for the general body. I agree. I agree. And I, and I think that the, um, what, one of the things I think that in terms of the, having the plan and having, you know, having our plan and having our strategy together is that, um, is that everybody needs to be represented at the table. You know, um, it, it, it used to be that only this core group of leaders were the ones who made the decisions or the ones who had, um, who had the right you know, or the right, so to speak, uh, to even to discuss matters. But, uh, but if we look at um, how things are rolling out, you know, in our, in our world right now, there are multiple generations that are on the front lines. And so when we start talking about strategies and we start talking about how we're going to get out of this and how we're going to uh, come back and what would you say, uh, Pastor Micah, secure the bag, you know, how we're going to secure the bag, you know, you got to, you got to take some people who can, when they get the bag, they can run, you know? So, um, so in other words, what I'm saying is, is that it can't be a bunch of, it, it can't all be baby boomers and, um, and, um, and the older population who's actually doing the legwork or doing the work and even actually bringing solutions to the table. Um, that I, I think that this is a time for us to, you know, and I talked about community in the beginning, it is a time for us to be able to sit and to really, really listen to one another, uh, to listen to what the needs are so that we're not, um, we're not asking for something to cram something down your throat that you're going to regurgitate on us. You know, so I, I think that, I think that that is another thing that is important. I, one thing that I was going to say um, um, earlier was that I think um, I, 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 what I loved about Nehemiah, both Nehemiah and Esther in this case is I love the fact that they were very courageous. They were, you know, they, they were the, those, they represent for me, you know, people that I want going ahead of me, people that I want, you know, leading us out and leading the troops. I, you know, because they had great courage and they were not willing to back down from going to battle for, again, for a people and not just for a person or a particular household. So, uh, yeah, so how do we, how we move past, I, I see your, I see your mind just ticking, Pastor Micah. Yeah. You know, yeah. What, what I was thinking as we were talking mm -hmm. and just seeing where we are, because there's a lot going on We've, with the pandemic, the pandemic has influenced a lot of things. Yes. As well as now the civil, you know, the term civil unrest that we see going on has added another level to that. Even when we look at um, the business sector and the financial sector has been affected by both. So here's what's happening. Now you see that all there are meetings and there are strategy things that are now happening in these different areas. What has to happen is that the voice of the kingdom has to be at these tables. Yes. So when, it, when the school board is sitting, talking about now, how do we move forward uh, next school year? And how do we address this particular need? There has to be people that represent the body of Christ mm -hmm. and, and can speak intelligently to that and has gone to God and prayed to God and, and can have a say when it comes to the business sector and as, we, as, uh, as we're in our different industries, and as these meetings are happening of how to move forward and what needs to happen, we can speak in those situations. When it comes to investments, there are so many companies and, and things that are now saying, okay, we need to invest in these communities. We need to address these uh, societal issues. Where do we spend the money? Where are the resources? We have to be able to be at that table and, and, and speaking to those things on behalf of our community. So in all of these different areas, even as it relates to 
the body of Christ and the church and how the church itself moves forward. We need real godly people in those conversations representing the, the body and moving the body forward, not somebody who's uh, self-centered and self-focused and trying to build their kingdom, but really build the kingdom of God. We have to be in every situation and uh, in all these settings speaking to those situations and using that the influence and the voice of God and the spirit of God and being a part of that. Because as these new uh, new norms are starting to be uh, addressed and these issues are starting to be addressed and these plans are coming forward, we have we can't just sit by, sit at home and, and not say anything and not speak. We need to find out where these meetings are happening. We need to find out what's going on in our commun community. Once we define what our community is, if it's where you live or if it's where you worship, whatever, uh, or, or you know, where the community where you work, wherever you're spending time or where your children go to school, because sometimes your kids may not be in the same neighborhood if you don't, your children don't live in the same house as you, especially those of us that are fathers. You have to find yourself speaking and coming to the table and not just seeing the email or seeing the announcement like, oh, well, you know, somebody else will do it. No, you ha we have to make sure that we are represented in these situations and at these tables because it's happening. And now everybody's sitting back, okay, here we are. What do we need to do next? Like, as you're saying, Apostle, everybody's saying, okay, what do we do next? And they're setting up these meetings. They're setting up these conversations. And we have to find ourselves in those conversations. Mm -hmm. And the truth of the matter, um, uh, Pastor Micah, is that these meetings are going on right now, <laughs> yes. and um, and they are, and it's it, it behooves us not to find just to find out uh, where the meetings are, but become knowledgeable about you know they send out agendas and things like that of what's being discussed at the meeting, so you can be fully prepared when you get to the meeting to speak specifically to what's on the agenda. Uh, and then if there are other things that are neat that need to be brought up, uh, you know, to to ask God, is this the time? Because sometimes you got great ideas, but it's the wrong time, you know, for it to come out. Or you need to speak with someone one on one before you put it out to a general to the general public. So it's things like that that we we've talked before about our circle of influence. Well, guess what? This is is here. <laughs> so um, our circle of influence is making that step in the community uh, and representing God well. Uh, there was a situation that recently happened with uh, the World Health Organization where one of the members uh, spoke out something in reference to uh, the coronavirus and so forth, only for it to be pulled back because that wasn't really the voice of the general body uh, uh, of those persons on the board. And so we've got to make sure that what we say, we are representative of the, of the full community or the majority of the community to see what the needs are specifically for them and come to the table packed with your knowledge. You've done your homework. Uh, before you got there in order to make sure that when you put something before the king, if you will, it is something that the king can hear. Yeah, I, I you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting over here and trying to be quiet tonight, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I, but I, but I, but I, you're not, you know, I'm going to go, go there. I, I think that, that we are, um, Unfortunately, in, as it relates to um, the body of Christ, we have gone through a, a season where the prophetic had been perverted. Mm. Yeah, oh the prophetic office had been perverted. And so, um, so that has, so there is a requalifying now for a prophetic voice to be believable. Mm. Because there is, I see you, Pastor Mike, you're like, oh Lord. <laughs> yeah, but you know, but we've we we've got a, you know, uh, what was it last week? I think it was that that the Lord gave me the word about sanctify yourselves. Mm. And and I believe that now we are in a season where every prophet needs to sanctify themselves. So that when they speak 
that they will speak the word of the Lord and not what the people want to hear, but we are in fact speaking um, speaking the word of the Lord. I think that we, we've got we to gotta bring back the, uh, because now is where the prophet really should be speaking, could be speaking if we had not messed it up mm. with a bunch of foolishness. Yeah, I said that. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think um, I think that we've got to, you know, that now. So that's my that's my challenge right now to um, to the mouthpieces, people that have been been called by God to speak. You know, you, we talk about I'm going to the nations. I'm the Lord sending me to the nations. Y yeah, it, maybe perhaps. Um, but if we're going to go to the nations, we've got to go in the name of the Lord. Hmm. And not in the and not in our own names, right. you know, right. and not with all that extra fluffy stuff that uh, doesn't even compute for the season, the time, and the seasons that we're in. And so, um, so I believe that. So when you talk about having um, um, that, you know, making sure that the body of Christ is at, is represented at the table, I think that you know they're making all kinds of plans. But we need to, if we're going to the table, we need to send our best voices. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, who among you, <laughs> who among you is the spirit of the Lord upon to be able to speak it? And that person may not have been ordained a prophet by the people mm -hmm. or by the church, but God may use them to be the ones to go in and prophesy on our behalf and say, thus said the Lord, uh, these are the things that we're going to need. Even down, even where it relates to economics, um, uh, you talked about uh, what are the things that, you know, that our, what are the investments, you know, where, where should we be putting our dollars now? You know, um, that's going to be meaningful later. I believe that there are, uh, prophetic prophetic voices who can even speak to that if they will allow themselves to be used by God in the season and not just to equip their their little group you know just their little pocket of people because they want to again they want to make sure that their connections are the ones who will still be the ones all holding the bag. And so then we get back into the same situation where there's the inequities across the board in terms of who has the wealth. Well, if we if God is, has, has allowed for the systems to be torn down, then if we're going to rebuild them, we've got to rebuild them on a sure foundation and mm -hmm. something that does not look like what we just got delivered from. Mm -hmm. Now we just got delivered from it, but what are we be, what are we being delivered to? <laughs> you know, what are we being what are we willing to be delivered to? You know, so uh, so I'm you know I I think that we are uh, we're we're sitting on the edge of something very great. I, and now and I will go back with in, in terms of the prophet. Now, um, you know, you guys know I got a little old school in me. Um, but I remember that when prophets when prophets showed up in a city when they came to your town they came because god sent them they were not booked up six months in advance not coming to bring the word of the lord when they came and spoke what god gave them to do and there was an order about how they spoke it Hmm. Whatever they, what they, when the Lord sent them, the Holy Spirit sent them into a city to speak a word. When they got there, it was like they would get off the bus <laughs> and show up at the church to see the pastor that the Lord sent them to that city to meet and to give them a word from the Lord. That's old school. That's old school prophets. They were sent. Even in biblical times, the prophet didn't just show up in the city. He had to be summoned to a place. It wasn't because they needed to book their calendar. It was because the Holy Spirit sent them with a direct word from the Lord. 
And when they finished, they were going to the city. I know and I'm telling the truth. Uh, there are some people from, from back in the day that know that this is how this thing worked. Um, you were at, at, a, at a church, uh, Pastor Micah, where I, I know they showed up like this at your church too, where when they came into the city, they would go straight, they would get off the bus or get off the highway and go straight to that church. They wouldn't even check themselves into the hotel. They wouldn't go get a bite to eat. They would go straight there and go and tell that pastor what thus said the Lord. And then it would be, it would either the pastor would receive it or they would reject it. And once they gave that word, the prophet would be gone. Unless that pastor said, you know what? Now I know this got to be God. So um, I, can you stay over and talk to my people? I want to give you some space to talk to our to talk to our people. And they would re and and if if the Holy Spirit had given them the release, they would stay in the city to release a word to those people. And then if the pastor wanted them to stay over, you know, a little while longer, they would they would either have the release from God or not. But they didn't go from one church to the next church. I'm getting in trouble, but I don't care. They go, they would go from they wouldn't go from one church to the next church. It wouldn't be that they would get on the circuit because they had prophesied, you know, something that came to pass right away, you know, and then the next pastor wanted them. And so then they float around the city. It wasn't like that. They were sent by God. And so I believe that God is restoring the order of the prophet in this and his voice in uh in back into the body of Christ so that we will hear from voices that are purified in the presence of God that have been vetted by the spirit of the Lord so that when we need somebody to speak on our behalf that you know that there is there a is there a word from the Lord that wasn't just a preach word. Is there a word from the Lord? Is God saying something to us as a people? And uh, and who who will go who will go up for us? Mm -hmm. And who will speak for Zion? Yeah. So that that's uh, I I don't want else, but that's yeah. It. Because even even going back to to Nehemiah in chapter two, he yeah. was doing a physical building, but he also yeah. was was bringing order to exactly. Jerusalem. Yes. It was like, hey, y'all 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 have missed the mark. You know, yeah. this is what's going on. This is where you know this is going on. That this you 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 guys have gotten away from God. Yeah. You've gotten away from the things that brought you here. So this is how it's going to be restored. Because He promised it to Moses. Like if y'all just get, come back to Him, He's gonna He's gonna bring everything back. That's all you have to do. That's what He told God. He said, God, I understand. You said we turn away from you. You was gonna spread us. But if we come back, you're gonna have favor on us. You're gonna shine on us. You're gonna cause us to to grow up and prosper and all that. So Nehemiah had, he took that word. So not only was he building a physical wall, it, it would do no good for him to just build a physical wall and still have chaos going on in the hearts and the minds of the people. So he understood that with his voice, that he used his voice now for his community to say, hey, we have to really get back to God for real. Yeah. Not just in, in when you know the story, they got together. Then later on, you know, they went their own way again, which was which would happen with the children of Israel. We understand that. But for that period in that time, Nehemiah spoke and did what he had to do. And he stayed there as a governor. And then once his work was done, guess what? He went back to serve the king again. He didn't say, oh, well, I built this wall. I didn't got everything in order. I'm, you know, I'm the man here. He, no, he Put left. my name on the building. He didn't say that. Yeah, no. <laughs> even, the, even the house he built, he left the house. He had to leave the house so he couldn't take it with him. He right. went back and continued to be the cupbearer for the king after his work was done. He didn't get the big, he's like, okay, now the it's up there. Do you mean he <laughs> went back to service? Are you, are you kidding me? He went back to, to <laughs> making sure that the king's wine or food was not poison. <laughs> he went back oh to God. serving the king. You mean after you got all, all that high, you went back to serving? Are, are you serious? After doing all of that. After getting the release of the Lord, after you getting the release from the king's list, after getting all that. He yes. went back to serving. He wow. Back to serving. <laughs> he, 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 he. Hey, hey, will there be one? <laughs> <laughs>
and, and, and I think, and I think yeah. it, it's a key point oh because sometimes we feel like we become too big to serve. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or that serving is, ben, is beneath us. Help but us. actually, had he not been a servant, he would not ha- have had the voice and the closeness and the position. The audience. What he did. Because yeah. ser- sometimes serving puts you in places that other that having other positions don't put you in. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you can be a, a leader or a governor or whatever that position is and never get the opportunity to, because you got to make an appointment. You got to do, they may want to talk to you. They may not. But as a servant, he had daily access mm-hmm. and audience with the king. And then at that, at, when the timing was right, he used that audience to say, this is what's going on. This is what, it, because he served faithfully. And mm-hmm. so you, even in that, you have to, we have to understand that because of his faithfulness and because he did it with joy, the king noticed that one day that he wasn't serving with joy. It wasn't that he, w- it, w- it was a hard thing for him to serve. Mm-hmm. It was just his heart was heavy. Mm-hmm. So the king was trying to figure out what it was. Like, you don't look physically sick. You must really be depressed. Like something has to be weighing on you because you always serve me with joy. Mm-hmm. And so that's the key. Where, wherever we are, we have to do it with a sense of joy and pride. And so after the work is done, go back and serve with joy because it puts you, it puts us in a position as things we learn being in a place of serving. And I'm sure that even in uh, Nehemiah's serving, he understood the personality of the king. He understood his likes, his dislikes, because he had that place with the king that other people did not have. So he was able to go in and say exactly how he needed to say it, the way he needed to say it. That's why the first thing he said was, long live the king. Because he understood, I gotta, I gotta give you some props. Mm-hmm. It's not you, long live the king. It's my pleasure to serve thee. However, I can't help but to be sad because this is what's going on. You know, you know this is a whole, this, this, I'm just sitting here and I'm saying, this is a whole series on serving. On serving. Just on serving. I know we were talking about moving. How do we get from um, move out of pain? <laughs> you know, how do we how do we get out of get get away from the pain points of this season? But if this is a it's very powerful. I, I mean, I'm just hearing various you know revelations about this whole serving uh, serving aspect and um, and the need. How many you know? What is it? What was it in uh, Cleopatra the movie? where they had the tasters who would taste to make sure that there were no that whatever the whatever she was eating that it wasn't going to kill her you know that position is one of the most trusted of mm-hmm. any of the other servants that you are the closest to the king as a servant because he puts his literally puts his life in your hand mm-hmm. yes literally Yes. Wow. Um, and then in, in one of the things you, you kind of touched on was, was economics. And mm-hmm. the thing that we also have to understand is that there was an economical piece to this, mm-hmm. that there were certain resources and, and things that he needed to do the job. And he used the resources for what he said he was going to use them for. And um, so you're trying to tell us he was honest. He was honest. <laughs> he said, I need this. You know, he laid out everything he needed. He had the resources. He went and he accomplished the work. Even even the part about building the wall, they said in 52 days, which means he went in working. Mm-hmm. Had the people around him. Even the neighbors was trying to present opposition. But in 52 days, he built, he rebuilt the wall. Then after that, he spent time speaking to the people and, and, and the com- his community to, okay, the walls are now built, so let's work on these other things. So I think the key is that we have to understand too, there's a lot that's going on economically. Mm-hmm. So we have to make sure that the resources that we do have, that we're investing first in, our ki- in the kingdom of God, but then also outside of that, where, where is my investment go- going to be going? Because we don't want to be like, uh, with, with the one talent and go bury it. You know what I'm saying? We want to make sure that 
we're utilizing the resources and the things that God has given us also that will help to build the kingdom of God. Because here's the thing we have to understand that oftentimes when there are um, financial situations that happen or financial ruins or uh, financial calamity, I've looked at stocks and the stocks in some areas is low as low as it's been in a very long time. Mm -hmm. And even in just something that simple, praying to God, like, God, I want to be able to be a good steward over what you gave me. Where do I need to invest this money? Yes, I'm, I'm going to give it to the church. But then outside of that, what, what, what is going to cause me to prosper so that I will have more to give to the kingdom, that my family, because what we're supposed to be doing, we're supposed to be leaving an inheritance. An inheritance right. And so what is it that I also need to be doing in this season and in this time to help to leave my inheritance for my children and my children's children. Because we know that in, in times past when there's been a, a recession or a great depression, those that made wise investments, they became wealthy or obtained great wealth because they took the little bit that they had and invested it in the right things. So um, we have, to, again, we have to look at things from a, a um, I'll say play, we have to play the long game in a lot of things because a lot of things we want instant gratification. Mm -hmm. we, the wall was not built, even though he built it very quickly in 52 days, he didn't build the wall in a day. It says that even, and here's the thing, even before he went to the king, he spent four months in prayer before he even okay. opened his mouth. Four months in prayer hmm. before hmm. he even said anything. So, Understanding that sometimes we have to play the long game and even what we do in investments that we make, whether it's through tithe offering, whether it's through stocks, whether it's through investing in someone's business to say, hey, I'm a partner with you. We have to understand because all of, a lot of people want a quick turnaround. Mm -hmm. And so it entices us to get into these uh, pyramid, these multi-level marketing schemes. Pyramid. Uh, mm -hmm. I can turn your 100 into 1500 in a month. Mm -hmm. But if we understand true wealth and building, we understand that mm -hmm. that $100, it may take some years mm -hmm. to get $1,000. You know what I'm saying? So once you understand that, but it also, I was, I've had this conversation with a few people that when we look at it just from a economical standpoint, just on the surface, that equates to ownership. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times when we're talking about certain industries or certain companies, not um, we don't have a voice or we feel like they turn a blind ear to what's going on in our community. Guess what? If you have stock, you now have ownership, which gives you a voice. So imagine if we, even as the body of Christ and as our community start to put those, those funds together and change and everything, it's one thing to boycott, which is great. But it's another thing to buy the block <laughs> or to buy the company. And guess what? When it comes time for the shareholder meetings, when it comes time to the, for the board meetings, you now have a voice. They will send you, like the companies that I've invested in, they send you, when it's time to vote, they are sending you the information because mm -hmm. now you have a voice. Mm -hmm. Now you have influence over what's going on. So you, it, it eliminates the whole thing. Well, this company doesn't care about us. and this. And it's true, but once we start to make investments and, and, and create that wealth and that ownership in these companies, and a lot, of, and the thing is like, sometimes, and I think we don't do a great job, and this is going to a whole nother arena, but we're just touching on moving on. We aren't taught about stocks and investment a lot of times. And the, the narrative is that you need a whole bunch of money, but any of us that have actually gotten started realize you don't need a whole lot of money, nope. but the not, the information is not there because there there are certain gatekeepers that don't give the regular people the information, and the information sometimes is not always easy to navigate or it can be scary. But even in this, as we're talking about moving on and using our voice, is that we have to find those that have the knowledge and can actually give uh, guidance even in that area so that we are not left behind first as a community, as a body of Christ, as an individual, and we're not leaving wealth on the table. 
He's given us what? The power to get wealth, right? So there are multiple things that we have to be doing, even in this season. It may seem dry. It may seem like, like when you look at the stocks and you look at business and, you know, this company going bankrupt and this company having to restructure, it's also the time of opportunity. Hmm. And we have to position ourselves to be in the, the place that we can seize upon the opportunity because here's what's going to happen. And I'm going to drop this here. There is a lot of things in a lot of industries that are suffering right now. Let's say, for instance, cars. I'm going to just speak because we love to talk about cars and new cars. Um, their cars are not being sold right now. Right. So you have a lot of dealerships. You have a lot of manufacturers that are going to, in a few months, are going to have to be moving these cars. So guess what happens? Now it puts you in a better position to use your finances and not break your bank. Because now you're going to have the bargaining position and uh, you have to understand the market to say, hey, this car that at the beginning of the year, they may drop the price $10,000 mm-hmm. when it's time for me now to go to the table. Mm-hmm. So in understanding that there are certain things that you, may, that you may have wanted to do or invest in or buy, if you're patient and it, it takes prayer. See, that's the thing. We try to separate. God, I'm praying, God, show me. When it's time for me to move in this, I don't want to move ahead of you. If I'm buying a house, God, let, let me watch the market because the house that I, the price may be coming down. There's certain, I may want to take a vacation that that's coming down. Those things, we have to have our ear to not only uh, what's going on in the natural, but I don't believe that God and the Holy Spirit is, is separate from what we do in the marketplace and what we do financially. It's, so part, of, it's be, part of the perception. Yes, yes. It's part of, of the changing of our perception, you know, of looking at things uh, from, a, from a different angle. Right. Um, and um, and getting, the, getting the whole view yes. of what it is that God is trying to do. It's like, you know, sometimes your view is, to, um, is about timing, mm-hmm. you know, not to be in a hurry. You, you talked a few weeks ago about don't rush, you know, <laughs> and, and learning to not rush through things because there is an appointed time for everything. You know, Ecclesiastics talks about time. You know, if you want to know anything about time, go to Ecclesiastics and read that scripture. You know, it's a time for everything. And so right now is a time for us to, um, uh, to figure out how we're going to move past where we are. Uh, that we're going to pick up the pieces and we're going to, we're going to move forward and we're not going to leave. what you say? We're not leaving anything on the table. Um, everything that God wants us to have in this season, we, we are not leaving it on the table. We are, as you say, securing the bag. We are going to secure the bag. It, it, it's actually already in our hands, mm-hmm. but we don't know that that's what we're looking at. But it is already in our hands. It's already in our view. It is accessible. Uh, it is obtainable. Um, it is um, is worth not blinking about. Mm-hmm. You know. Uh, and, uh, Apostle, I would I would ask that if all of our the, the persons that are watching us tonight mm-hmm. that would take a moment this evening before you lie down to sit down and write down a few things that that uh, are representative not only of yourself but of your community of things that are needed that you can see the needs and how uh, how you can approach God prepare and approach God for the timing for you to speak about saying uh, speak about what is necessary uh, to take a moment and jot down some things you know a lot of a lot of our uh, inconsistencies are because we we put one thing out there this time and then we put something else out there another time and we're not being consistent but if we've got something an outline or whatever you to go by to look at some things and approach God um, and say Lord is this what you want us to do is this what you want me to do? Is this what you want us to do as a community, as a church, as a body of believers? Are these the people that I need to talk to? You know, who is it out there that I need to prepare for so that when the time comes, 
and it's presented to me. I've got this already. I've already meditated on it and I'm prepared to do the work. So I'm going to, I'm, I ask that people would sit down tonight and just jot down a few things. It doesn't have to be a whole laundry list. It could be just a few things, just a few things, whether you're watching the media or whether you're reading your Bible, there's some things that need to be, be addressed. So what is it that you can fit in? And the, when I say you can fit in, what is it that you know? What is it that you want to approach God about? in order to be able to move forward? Um, and, and how can I be prepared to do that? What do I need to do to prepare? Because sometimes some of us walk around uh, thinking that we, we know it all and we don't know it all. And we may need to do some things, go to a class, go to whatever it is, uh, approach God about what it is we need to know so that when the, the time presents itself, we, we will be ready. So I'm Amen. asking everyone to sit down tonight. Don't let another, th this is the day. <laughs> no, but tonight and sit down and write down a few things that we may be able to approach God about and see, is this something that I need to prepare for? You know, because quite honestly, many of us have gone into so many different directions. We haven't taken the time to really focus on the one thing that God really wants us to do. And I will and I will add to that um, to to not don't box yourself in mm -hmm. on the on that vision board that you created. Yes. Which um, from from most vision boards that I have seen people do, um, it represents fantasy world and not necessarily things that may be perhaps the Lord is really wanting from you, you know, that this time that when you seek, seek God about what that list is, that you ask God what he wants and not so much what, what you want in this season. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I would, you know, on top of that, um, with what Elder Cynthia was saying, definitely take some time, read, Nehemiah 1 and 2, because it, it's Nehemiah 1, the prayer mm -hmm. itself is a template for where we are right now. I feel like if we were, we're looking for a template of how, how to approach things, the way that Nehemiah prayed and addressed what was going on and what he needed is, is something that I feel like is very useful in this time. And then Nehemiah chapter 2 to see his approach and what he did. Those are two things that I think are going to be key in just kind of taking that and applying to where we are and where we need to go and how we need to move forward to take the things that like Ellison said that we can write down and say okay this is what I want to approach and how and that prayer in Nehemiah 1 give, gives the guidance in a sense to how to pray about it and, and, and pray for direction and favor and to speak to what's going on and to also remind God of his word and his promise, because that's what Nehemiah said. Nehemiah reminded God, you know, understand we saying we don't, he does, we don't have to remind God, but it's uh, what we say. You know, he brought his word back to him and said, you, pro you said this to Moses. Right. So I'm just repeating what you told Moses and promised us. So here's what you promised us. So I'm putting the word on this situation. We can never go wrong with praying the word. If we pray God's word, we can never go wrong. All right. <laughs> this is good. This is good. So um, let's, let's end this tonight. Um, and we end it with, um, Father, your word says that if your people who are called by your name would humble themselves and pray, seek your face and turn from their wicked ways, turn from our wicked ways, that then we will hear from heaven. You will heal our land and you will do exactly what you said you were going to do. And so, Father, tonight we trust you to do it. We lean on you and we depend on you for answers, for specific strat strategies, for giving us clarity, even in, even in the things that we pray, even in the things that we trust you for. Father, we look to you for help. 
We look to you. There is nobody else we can go to to help us. But Father, we thank you that you are a very present help when we are in trouble. Our world is in trouble. And so we're coming to you as a troubled people, but not, not a troubled people that cannot obtain victory because it is in you that we live, we move, have our being, we have our victory, we have our breakthroughs, we have our joy, we have our peace. Father, help us, so oh God, that as we approach your throne, as we approach you to ask for your strategies, Father, give us a joyful heart. Give us our joy back that when we come to you, we're not coming in a whining state, but we're coming in a matter of fact state that says, God, we trust you because we know that you are Jehovah and you have all of the answers that we need. And so, Father, we trust you for, in Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. Amen. Amen. Uh, this has been awesome. Thank you guys for joining us on Facebook. Um, and um, just keep following us. And uh, the Lord bless you real good. All right. Good night. <laughs>